17th January 1963, the Vekanando centenary year was formally inaugurated all over the country. Early in the year, ceremonial processions were taken out in Madras on the occasion. Leaders of the region carried portraits of Swamiji through important streets of the city. Festive music suitable to the occasion was played and ceremonial lamps lit. During one of the centenary celebration meetings in Delhi, our Prime Minister said, Rooted in the past, Swami Vivekananda was yet modern in his approach to life's problems and was a kind of bridge between the past of India and the present. Calcutta, where Swamiji was born, also celebrated the occasion in a befitting manner. In one such meeting in Calcutta, the President, Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, said, Swami Vivekananda, through his message of renunciation, service and discipline, had given India the lesson of gratitude in suffering, courage in despair. In the evening, there was a program in the newly built Ramakrishna Institute of Culture. century in India was a turning point in her long history. It was a challenge in the inner world of values, even more than in the outer. It was a period of clash and confusion, when the fate of the nation hung in the balance. Would India perish? Among the many figures that rose to meet that challenge and set the balance right, none was more vehement, none more effective then Swami Vivekananda, the greatest of them all, the spirit with the widest wings. A grateful nation gave its full and frank verdict of veneration for the saint and the saviour. So also the rest. For though India was the apparent theme of all or most of his labour, Vivekananda's vision easily overflew all narrow national and sectarian boundaries. A truly universal man, his vision applies equally well to the human situation. And if the crisis of civilization through which we are passing has to end, this may be the only way out, the way of the spirit and the way of harmony. It is only natural to wish to know something of this noble and remarkable career, profound and paradoxical, modern and ageless, of a rishi and a revolutionary. One soul's ambition lifted up the race. He drew energies that transmute an age. He made great dreams a mold for coming things and cast his deeds like bronze to front the years. This is Pamban, South India, where Swami Vivekananda set foot on the Indian soil after his triumphant tour of the West. This was on the 26th of January, 1897, a vast crowd waiting patiently to welcome the national hero, all of them waiting to pay their homage to Swami Vivekananda, the patriot saint, the first mighty voice of awakened India. Among them was the Raja of Ramnad, Haskar Setupati, with his state coach, ready to receive the royal ascetic. It was a hero's welcome indeed. It was indeed a memorable occasion, the Raja himself leading the throng. Here he comes, defender of the faith, darling child of India, India awakened.
army was quite overwhelmed. But he took it with dignity, with humility. At night, there was a torchlight procession, and then fireworks. In reply, the Swami said, This grand reception is made not unto a military general or a politician, a prince or a millionaire, but to a poor, penniless sannyasin. This shows the spirituality of India. This shows wherein lies the vitality of our nation. After the grand reception in the South, the Swami left for Calcutta, his hometown, where a grand reception was given to him. From there he began a series of inspiring speeches all over the country. My India, arise. The longest night seems to be passing away. Awake from this hypnotism of weakness. Stand up and assert yourself. Proclaim the God within you. Religion alone is the life of this country. When that goes, India will die. In spite of politics, in spite of social reforms, in spite of everything. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest the divinity within all of us. Do it either by work or worship, by psychic control or philosophy, by one or more or all of these, and be free. This is the whole of religion. Doctrines or dogmas, rituals, books, temples, forms are but secondary details. In all his speeches, nothing was so touching and so revolutionary as his wide and natural sympathy for the poor and the fallen. Do you feel that millions and millions of descendants of gods and sages have become next-door neighbors to brutes? Do you feel that millions are starving today and millions have been starving for ages? Your ancestors have written a few philosophical works, penned a dozen or so epics, or built a number of temples. That is all. And you rend the sky with triumphal shouts. While those whose heart's blood has contributed to all the progress that has ever been made in the world. Well, who cares to praise them? Ye ever trampled laboring classes of India, I bow to thee. For the next fifty years, let all other vain gods disappear from our minds. This is the only God that is awake, our own race. The first God that we have to serve and worship are our own people. Everywhere his hand, everywhere his feet. He covers everything. Sarvatokshi shiro mukham sarvata shutimalloke Faith. Faith in ourselves. If you have faith in the 330 millions of mythological gods and still have no faith in yourselves, there is no salvation for you. Let us all work hard, brethren. This is no time to sleep. On our work depends the coming of the India of the future. And how did this remarkable life begin? One is naturally curious to know, and this is a good time to remember. It was here in the city of Calcutta that Swami Vivekanand or Narendra Nath was born on the 12th of January, 1863. Not far from the holy river Ganga, in this house in its neighborhood, the boy Naren used to play as a child like other children. 
His father, Sri Vishwanath Datta, was an attorney of the Calcutta High Court. Well-versed in Persian and English literature, but typical of his time, his father was indifferent to the Indian cultural heritage. But his mother, Srimati Bhuvaneshwari Devi, belonged to the old Hindu tradition. Religious by temperament, she would often read to the boy tales from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. This was the seed of spiritual life sown early in Narayan's mind. His boyish imagination was fired by these tales of heroic idealism. Ramchandra going to the forest in exile, renouncing his kingdom to keep up the promise of his father. Jatayu, the eagle king's self-sacrifice to rescue Sita. Bharat's devotion to his brother in exile. Krishna and Arjun in the battle of Kurukshetra. Mother of the universe, goddess Durga. One day he purchased a little image and took it quietly up into the attic. A frantic search was made for the missing lad when at last he was discovered here, sitting self-absorbed before his Ishta, chosen deity. Those days in gentlemen's homes, one would come across these separate hookahs or hubba bubbles for the different castes and for the Hindus and the Muslims. Naren was curious, and one day he took some whisks from the hookah marked for people of the lower caste. Then he tried, one after the other, the hookah for the Brahmins and the hookah for the non-Brahmins. Men are all alike. Then why are the hookahs different? thought the young ascetic. What are you doing there, Naren? Oh, Father, I'm just trying to find out how one loses caste. But I can't really find any difference. Oh, you devil. So the boy grew up into a brave and brilliant, intellectually alert young man. Reverend Hasty, the principal of his college, who had taught Norin, had this to say about him. I have traveled far and wide, but I have never yet come across a lad of his talents and possibilities. He is bound to make a mark in life words that would one day come true. In his student life, he came in contact with the Western intellectual tradition through the works of Kant, Hegel, Hume, and Herbert Spencer, to whom he had once written a letter. The scientific ideas and nihilistic thoughts of Western thinkers shook to their foundation the religious beliefs he had inherited. They raised such a tumult in his mind that he despaired of any final answer. Raja Ram Mohan Rai, the founder of Brahmo Samaj, had broken away from the rituals, the image worship and the priestcraft of Orthodox Hinduism. As an intellectually alive young person, Norin could not but be interested. He had joined the Samaj partly because of his sympathy with its program of social reforms. But this did not satisfy his deeper spiritual yearnings. Of a strong, positive cast of mind, he wanted to see the truth, face to face, and not merely hear talks about it. In those days, Keshav Chandra Sen was a renowned orator and religious leader of the Samaj. There were also men like Vijay Krishna Goswami, Shivnath Shastri and others. They all spoke of a merciful God and delivered sermons learned and beautiful to hear. But Norin's hunger remained. The doubts lingered still. Does God really exist? If so, has he form? Or is he formless? Has anybody seen God? Can he be seen? How? In his agony and despair, Norin went round the leaders of different sects in the city and its suburbs. He had a single and straight question. Have you seen God? Have you seen God? Have you seen God? But none could answer. At last he thought of going to Maharshi Devendranath Thakur, the venerable leader of the Brahma Samaj. Devendranath was then staying in a houseboat on the Ganga. There went Narendranath unannounced. At the time, the Maharshi was in deep meditation. 
when Norin suddenly pushed open the door and stood before him, agitated but respectfully. Sir, have you seen God? No, my boy. But you have the eyes of a yogi. You should practice meditation. If a person like the Maharshi could not give a positive answer, then who could? Was there anything in religion after all? Obstinate questionings wrecked his youthful soul. But soon, relief would come from unexpected quarters. After a few days, one of his cousins, who had been watching his movements, Ramchandra Dutto, told Noren, Noren, if you really wish to lead a spiritual life, you should go to Sri Ramakrishna at Dokineshwar. What? You ask me to go to that illiterate priest of Kali? What does he know? I have read Kant, Hegel, Hume, Spencer, and you now ask me to go to a man who does not even know how to write his own name. But Narin, what is the harm in a visit? Ramchandra said. Even if you do not like the man, you may like the place. Argument indeed. One day, he went to Dukhineshwar and paid a visit to the temple of Kali on the eastern bank of the river where Ramakrishna was then living. Sri Ramakrishna took to him at once. But Narin had other things on his mind. And after a few preliminaries, he shocked the assembled group by asking his inevitable question. Sir, have you seen God? Yes, I see him just as I see you here. Only in a much intenser way. Yes, yes, God can indeed be realized like that. Not only that, you can talk to him as I am talking to you. For the first time, he was face to face with a man who said openly and without guile that he had seen God and even talked to him. He had met his match, for Ramakrishna, though ignorant in the worldly sense of the term, had crossed the ocean of illusion and realized the supreme truth. He was a Siddha, an avatar, and he had already marked Narin for his own. Here the goddess Kali had revealed herself to her devoted child, Ramakrishna, and bestowed upon him all the divine grace of a transcendental wisdom. Kali, the mother goddess, has often been misunderstood in and out of India. The word Kali is derived from Kal or time. Hence, she is a symbol of death and destruction. In another and deeper sense, she is also the transcendence in which all mental ideas and forms disappear. In the inner view of things, she is a power of Brahman or reality. If, in one hand, she holds the severed head, in the other, she offers boons and protection. Destroyer and preserver, Kali the mother, is the goddess of the brave and the heroic. It was a quiet day. Sri Ramakrishna was seated on his bed, relaxed, when Narin entered and approached him. Ramakrishna was very glad to see Narin, as he always was. But the next moment, the saint had gone into a deep ecstasy. Then he muttered something and came closer and closer to where Narin was sitting. He stood up still in ecstasy and touched Norin's body. My parents at home. All right. All right. Let's rest now. Everything will come in time. And for a while, 
all was as before. But really, it would never be the same again. The incident, first of the series, amazed Norin. Thereafter, he could not help thinking more and more of Sri Ramakrishna. But he would not give in so easily. A part of his being still questioned. Could this be hypnotism? He wondered. It was something that he could not explain. Anyway, Norin continued to visit Dokhineshwar. At times, he openly ridiculed Ramakrishna, which hurt and shocked the simple devotees. But for all that, he could not deny or resist the unbounded love and childlike simplicity of the saint. It was at this time that Norin, then barely 21, was faced with unexpected difficulties. His father passed away. A large-hearted man, Sri Vishwanath Dutto, had lived beyond his means and left no savings. Here he is, without rest, without security, on the Maidan in Calcutta. There was nothing he had not tried and failed. At last, Norin went to Sri Ramakrishna and prevailed upon him to appeal to Mother Kali to relieve the distress of his family. To this, Sri Ramakrishna said, I have never asked for any material gains from my mother. I cannot do that even now. But if you go to the temple this evening and ask for yourself, I assure you, the mother will grant you whatever you ask for. But why will she listen to me? I say she will, Ramakrishna said. It was evening. Sri Ramakrishna asked Norin to go inside the temple and pray to the mother. He went accordingly. Ramakrishna asked, did you ask the mother to remove the distress of your family? Norin said, Oh no, I forgot. What did you ask for then? asked Ramakrishna. I asked for wisdom, devotion and renunciation. Go and ask again. Norin went thrice, but every time like his master, for himself, he could not ask anything. Norin had a fierce intellect. For six years, he struggled and struggled. But during this period, he learned prodigiously. Among other things, he learned from his matchless master or guru. All the rivers flow to the same ocean of supreme being. The goal is the same for all. He learned but the one who is Hori to the Hindus is Allah to the Muslims. And that the Father in Heaven to whom the Christians pray is but another name of the same Supreme Being. Amritasaputra Aedhamani Divyani Tastu Vedahamitam Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varanam Tamasa Parastat Tameva Viditvati Mrityumeti Nanna Pantha Thus spake Ramakrishna to the disciple he had marked and chosen. To Narendra Nath, his guru seemed to symbolize India's ageless culture, a living embodiment of all that was best in man and in India. From Sri Ramakrishna, he learned that religion was not something to be merely talked about. 
but that it must be realized and lived out. He also learned that unity and diversity was nature's plan and that India had a message for the world today. He must live that truth and spread the master's message, come what may. In the meantime, Sri Ramakrishna had fallen seriously ill and had to be removed to this garden house at Kashipur in the neighborhood of Calcutta. The end was near. He advised the disciples to dedicate their lives to the service of God and man. He also nominated Narin as the head of the group. He called the twelve disciples and gave them the ochre robe, the age-old symbol of the ascetic life in India. He gave some final instructions to Narin. Take care of the boys, he said. Thus was formed the nucleus of the Ramakrishna order or mission. Four days before he passed away, he called Narin. Soon he went into deep ecstasy, but for some time he kept looking intently at Norin's eyes. He was clearly concentrating for a purpose. Norin felt as if a subtle force resembling an emanation of electric energy was flowing into his body. Norin, today I have given you all I had. There is nothing of my own left. Now with these, you shall carry out great tasks in the world. And on the 15th of August, 1886, the master passed away. But he had left a successor, trained for mighty deeds. After the passing away of the master, the young disciples lived in this tumble-down house which no one else would rent. The house enjoyed the reputation of being haunted. It certainly looked its part. For their daily needs, they had to beg from door to door. Not all were as kindly as this lady here. For many days, they had just rice and salt, an austere diet indeed. But they did not complain. The brave band was undaunted, and Norin kept the group going valiantly and patiently towards wider horizons of service, sacrifice, and fulfillment of the Master's wishes. Soon a break came. In India, it is customary to go on pilgrimage. The Swami felt the urge, and for some time he became a wandering monk or parivrajika. For him, it was a new experience of India and her people, and must have sharpened his sense of mission. In 1881, he left Calcutta. He first went to Banaras, or Varanasi, the heart of religious Hindustan. Holy its air, fully the very dust of the city of Shiva. In the temple of Vishwanath, he glimpsed eternal India, ageless, the same forever. They come from all over the country, speaking different languages, following different customs. Here, the Swami could feel the source of Indian unity, the unity of culture and religion, her wide toleration and deep understanding of the ways of the spirit. Sometimes in the evening, the young Swami would sit here on the river ghat. And his mind would go back to Dukhineshwar and his master. He also paid a visit to Ajodha, sacred city of Ramo, and Brindavan, city of Krishna. Pushkar, the legendary birthplace of Brahma himself. Rishikesh, land of ascetics and spiritual seeking down the ages. 
He saw the exquisite paintings of Ajanta, the rock-cut temples and sculpture of Elora, the Buddha stupa at Sanchi, the shrines of Bhuvaneshwar, the famous sun temple of Konarak, and he felt within himself the imperishable heritage of India, mighty voices of silence whispering their deathless enchantment. From all these, he drew fresh inspiration. Hastinapur or Delhi, where the fate of so many empires has been decided at one time or the other, rich in Mughal remains, forts, turrets, mosques, palaces, the splendor of its architecture impressed the Swami. Taj Mahal, splendid symbol of the love of Shah Jahan for his beloved Muntaz Mahal. A lover's gift, a poem in marble. He visited Fatehpur Sekri, the dream city of Akbar, where the emperor had nursed hopes of a universal faith in Bin Elahi. Rajasthan, the land of chivalry and heroism, its capital, Jaipur, is the first planned city of India. In this city, Swamiji stayed for months to take lessons in Panini from the pundit of the royal court. The fort at Ammer, a landmark in medieval history. Chittor, forever associated with Rana Pratap's defense of the motherland, with the fatal beauty of Padmani and her fire ordeal, and the matchless devotion of Mirabai, the Saint Queen of India. Famed lake city of Udaipur, proud relic of resistance and martyrdom of the Rajputs and their sense of beauty and bravery. A splendid past indeed. But India today was more like a ruin. Today she lived in miserable huts and holes, in city slums. The glories of the past meant nothing to these people. They were at best memory's mockery, a consolation prize for cards and do nothing. Everywhere he saw the plight of the masses of India, despised by priests, oppressed by heartless landlords, exploited by generations of money lenders. Every year, the flood came. Everywhere, people were dying of poverty, of famine and flood. The nation had been reduced to rags, no hope anywhere, while only a few enjoyed the good things of life. Not a moment of his waking life when he did not think of his poor country folk and of what man had made of man. It was not merely lip sympathy. He lived with them and found spiritual treasures in their midst. He slept in stables where no gentleman ever set his foot. He lived on the pallets of beggars, sharing their life. The words of his master came back to him again and again. Religion is not for the empty bellies. And he himself later said, What have we done for the masses? Teaching them metaphysics? It is mockery to offer religion to a starving man. With this picture of the oppressed masses burning in his heart, the Swami came across the rulers of the Indian states, the native princes. In the course of his travels, he met the Raja Ajit Singh of Khetri, the Maharaja Mangal Singh of Alwar, the Maharaja Chamarajendra Vadiyar of Mysore and the Raja Bhaskar Setupati of Ramnad and many others. He believed that if these people, placed in positions of advantage, took up the cause of India and her starving masses, the country's progress could be hastened. He always reminded the rulers of their duty towards the people. There was something about the youthful Swami and they listened. They who were given more to command than to listen. In his conversation with the Maharaja of Mysore, he had said, You are only the custodian of God's property. You should use it only for the benefit of God's children, that is, the people. The Maharaja of Mysore was inspired to introduce necessary reforms in his state. These encounters were not without their dramatic moments. Once in Alwar, the Maharaja Mangal Singh met him at the residence of his divan. The Maharaja was in a somewhat merry mood. And perhaps, to tease the Swami, he said, with a smile, You see, Babaji Maharaj, my forefathers built many temples, but I do not have any faith 
in those idols of stone or metal. The eyes of all present were fixed on the Swami. What would he say? He asked a counter question, harmless enough to begin with. Diwanji Sahib, whose picture is that on the wall, please? The Divan replied, It is the likeness of the Maharaja, Swamiji. Please bring down the picture, will you? And the picture was brought down. Now spit on that picture, Devanji. What is it, Devanji? But a piece of paper? Why can't you spit upon it? I say, spit. Spit upon it. Any one of you may spit upon it. What are you asking me, Swamiji? It is the likeness of our Maharaja. Don't you know that? But surely the Maharaja is not bodily present in the picture? It does not contain his flesh, blood and bone. It is, after all, an idol or an image. Yet you respect it as if it is your Maharaja himself. Isn't that so, Devanji? Yes. Yes, Swamiji. That is so. See, Your Highness, though the picture is not you in one sense, in another sense, it is you. They all look upon this picture with as much respect as they would upon your person. So, when men worship the image of God in stone or metal, they do not say or think, O oh stone, I worship thee. O oh metal, be merciful. They worship the divinity inherent or represented in these forms. The Maharaja admitted, Swamiji, you have opened my eyes. Forgive me that I ever spoke to you like that. Forgive me. Such was the Swami's unconventional method of bringing a great truth home. But the Swami never stayed at one place for long. No Parivrajika ever does. He travels through deserts, forests and mountains and vast fields. He learned a thing or two as he went along. This is Ketri House in Jaipur where a little dancing girl taught him a lesson in humility and understanding. In his honor, the Maharaja of Khetri had arranged a song and dance recital. The gathering, including the Maharaja, was waiting for the Swami. One of the courtiers had been sent to bring him. As the officer conveyed the invitation, the Swami said, It is quite unbecoming for a sannyasi to attend the performance of a dancing girl. When she learned what the Swami had said, the girl was deeply hurt. Overwhelmed by emotion, she soon started to sing a bhajan by Surdas. She has never sung like that before.
As the song ended, she looked up and bowed down before the presence which her song evoked. Swami's reserve was broken. He spoke to the girl with humility and admiration. Mother, I beg you to forgive me. You have opened my eyes. After a brief stay in Rajasthan, he resumed his journey. Now he proceeded towards the south by way of Gujarat and Maharashtra. He travelled in day and night till he reached the Minakshi Nebo of Madura, eloquent of the faith of the people and the Ravidian architecture. And further beyond to famed Kanyakumari, the virgin goddess and her temple. There, he prostrated himself before the goddess. After a time, he came out to the sea beach, where the waves stopped and tumbled. But a greater tempest was going on in his mind. He looked at the rock, the last jutting point yonder into the sea, and swiftly swam across the waters, and soon reached the rock that now bears his name, Vivekanando Rock. There, the panorama of Indian life and history flashed through his mind. A record of glory and shame, of past splendor and present wretchedness. The whole of India passes before his eyes. India, right from the ideal kingdom of Ram, Sri Krishna at Kurukshetra, the penance of Buddha, Emperor Ashok, the ancient university of Nalanda, Shankaracharya, Guru Nanak, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then the foreign invaders, the Hun, the Mongols, the Portuguese, the Battle of Plaza, and the English. A long, dark age of foreign domination. The vision of India was not without a meaning. There was work for him to do, not merely to contemplate the unchanging and the everlasting. The present called him urgently. It was not religion that had been the cause of the country's downfall. Indeed, true religion was nowhere being followed. How to raise the nation, the once mighty nation, the nation that still dared to dream of God and Godward ways. He raised his eyes to the ocean. The image of his master floated back, giving him new hope and a sense of direction. He would appeal to the world on behalf of India. He would go to America, the East and the West, the New and the Old, must know each other and help each other. Another chapter was opening in his and the world's history. On May the 31st, 1893, the Swami sailed for America by way of the Pacific. But he had no fixed idea or program. It was a leap into the unknown. He had heard vaguely about a parliament of world religions to be opened someday somewhere in America. He sailed by way of Ceylon, Penang, Singapore, Hong Kong, Nagasaki, Kobe, and then traveled by land to Yokohama to board the ship again. Artistic and industrial Japan impressed him. Inspired by the example of this newly awakened Asian country, he wrote to his friends and disciples in the draft. Come out of your narrow holes and see how the nations are on the march. India wants the sacrifice of her young men, mind you, not brutes. Sympathy for the poor, bread for the hungry mouths, enlightenment for the people at large, and struggle unto death to make men of those who have been brought to the level of beasts by the tyranny of your forefathers. He reached America, the land of hope and liberty and the venue of the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. On inquiry, he came to know that the Parliament of Religions would not be meeting till September. And as he had no references or credentials from a recognized organization, he could not be enlisted as a delegate. But completely alone and without any resources, he was finding it hard to cope with Chicago's high cost of living. He decided to go to Boston, which was cheaper. In Boston, he stayed as a guest of Miss Kate Sanborn. 
and it was there that he met Professor John Henry Wright of Harvard University. Professor Wright was so impressed that he insisted that Swami Vivekananda should represent Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions at Chicago. I have no credentials, replied the Swami. Professor Wright was surprised at this, and he said, To ask you, Swami, for your credentials is like asking the sun about its right to shine. On his own, Professor Wright gave him a letter of introduction to the president of the committee, the Parliament of Religions. In that letter he wrote, he is more learned than all our learned professors put together. Vivekananda reached Chicago from Boston late in the evening. His troubles were not yet over. On the way, he had lost the address of the office of the committee for the Parliament of Religion. And he had no money. Unable to find any other way of passing the night, he stayed like this in a boxcar in the railroad freight yard. He walked along Chicago's fashionable Lake Shore Drive. Hungry and weary, he knocked at several doors, but these would not open. Completely worn out, he at last sits down on the sidewalk, not knowing which way to turn. And then, suddenly his luck turned. From a window on the other side of the road, a lady saw him. Excuse me, are you a delegate to the Parliament of Religion? The good lady was Mrs. George W. Hale. She looked after his needs and later took him to the office of the Parliament of Religions. The Parliament of Religions opened on September the 11th, 1893. On the opening day, the Hall of Columbus was packed to the full. On the dais sat some of the best-known representatives of world faiths. Practiced orators, they all spoke eloquently about their own faith. At first, Vivekananda felt a little nervous. Silent and prayerful, he sat, the observed of all observers. It was in the afternoon that Vivekananda first addressed the Congress and through it, the world. After a short prayer to Saraswati, the goddess of speech, he started to speak. The words came, words that would soon go round the world. He began, Sisters, and brothers of America, and brothers of America, and brothers of America. A spontaneous clapping filled the house. The applause went on and on and on. The audience had never heard anything like this before. and brothers of America, I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks of the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of all religions. I thank you in the name of millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. Here are a few lines which are repeated every day by millions in my country. As the different streams reach the sea, the different paths that men take through their different tendencies all lead but to thee. It did not matter what else he said. The audience was at his feet. Vivekananda had come. He had spoken. And he had won. Upon the banner of every religion will soon be written, in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and not dissension. The Swami had not come to criticize only. His admiration of the new world was frank and unstinted. Hail, Columbia, the motherland of liberty. It has been given to thee to march as the vanguard of civilization with the flag of harmony. 
His speech had been like a tongue of flame. Everybody else was forgotten by his commanding and spectacular performance. The papers were full of him. They wrote, He is undoubtedly the greatest figure in the Parliament of Religion. After hearing him, we feel how foolish it is to send missionaries to this learned nation. He was a hit of the season, even if they could not spell his name correctly. A picture of Swami Vivekananda, called the Hindu monk, was displayed on the streets of Chicago. People passing by paid instinctive homage to the present. Previously, he had nearly succumbed to poverty. Now, it was an opposite danger. He was about to be smothered by riches and attention. At night, he could not sleep on the soft bed that had been prepared for him. Rolling on the ground and thinking of his countrymen and their lot, he cried. Oh, mother, what do I care for name and fame when my people and my motherland are sunk in the utmost poverty? Show me, O oh mother, how best I can help them. To be able to serve the cause of his unfortunate country, he accepted the offer of a lecture bureau. He thought that through the lecture bureau, he could spread his ideas more effectively. He toured extensively. As India's first unofficial ambassador, he placed India and all that was best in her culture before the modern world. But it was not all roses. His sudden success had given rise to jealousy. For a long time, slander and persecution followed him like a black shadow. In the end, it all died a natural death. He toured with the lecture bureau for six to eight months in different places and delivered a series of inspiring speeches. While lecturing in a church, he said, let me tell you, brethren, if you want to live, if you really want your nation to live, go back to Christ. You are not Christians. No, as a nation you are not. Go back to Christ. Yours is a religion preached in the name of luxury. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. Better be ready to live in rags with Christ than to live in palaces without him. Do I wish that the Christians would become Hindus? God forbid. Do I wish that the Hindus or Buddhists would become Christians? God forbid. The Christian is not to become a Hindu or Buddhist, nor a Hindu or Buddhist to become a Christian. But each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve his individuality and grow according to his own law of growth. But he soon cut off all connections with the lecture bureau and began to speak, free of any charges, an unusual thing to do in the United States. Soon he became the friend of eminent men and women like Professor William James of Harvard, great scientists like Nikola Tesla and Lord Kelvin, philosopher Ingersoll, John D. Rockefeller Sr., Leo Landberg, Francis and Betty Leggett, Sister Christine, Mrs. Ole Bull, with Mr. J.G. Goodwin, who gave his all for the Swami's cause, and Mrs. Ella Wheeler Wilcox, the noted American author, Madame Emma Calvé, the great opera star of the two continents. At the time, she was passing through an emotional crisis. She even tried to take her own life. Thrice, she left her house to drown herself, and each time, as though in a daze, she found herself in front of her friend's house, where Swamiji was staying at the time. Finally, she ventured into the house and in the veranda. All of a sudden, a deep and sonorous voice rang through. Come, my child. Don't be afraid. I moved towards the study door. When even without lifting his eyes, Swami told me of my secret problems and anxieties, which I knew were not known even to my closest friends. It seemed miraculous, even supernatural, but his words were of great solace to me. I was overwhelmed, and I knelt down. 
an inner door seemed to open before me. I was at peace with myself for the first time in so many months. It was during this busy period that he found time to write works like summer cottage in the Thousand Islands Park on the River St. Lawrence. Here, with 12 American disciples, the Swami passed seven memorable weeks. To this intimate group, he revealed brilliant flashes of illumination and the most profound wisdom. These were later published as inspired talks. Never was a title more justified. After he had stabilized his work in America, he turned to Europe briefly. This is London, 1895, where the Swami spent some time meeting and talking to people and giving them a better idea of Vedanta. His greatest acquisition in England was without doubt Miss Margaret Noble, a name that will always be remembered with gratitude while India lost. England also gave him Mr. and Mrs. Sevier. The couple donated all their life savings to the cause and made India their second home. After four years of travel and ministry to different countries of the West, Swami Vivekananda was returning home with some of his disciples. Yes, the tour had been a success, a triumph. He had hoped to find his militia ready for his word of command. But never did he expect that the whole nation, the people of India, would rise to a man and give him a welcome the like of which has never been seen before or after. The brilliant speeches which he gave all over the country spelt hope and courage. Men everywhere heard these as in a dream. Awake, arise, and stop not till the goal is reached. So long as millions live in hunger and ignorance, I hold every man a traitor who, having been educated at their expense, does nothing for them. Let the new India arise out of the peasants grasping the plow, out of the huts of fishermen, the cobbler, the sweeper. Let her spring from the factory, from hills and mountains. They have suffered eternal misery which has given them unflinching vitality. Give them only half a piece of bread and the whole world will not be big enough to hold their energy. Such was Swami Vivekananda's burning faith in the people, in the future of India. But the Swami was exerting himself too much. The sands were running out. Did he have a prevision of his coming end? On May the 1st, 1897, he called a meeting of the monastic order and the lay devotees of Sri Ramakrishna. Speaking of his master, Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda said, My teacher, my master, my hero, my ideal, my God in life. If there has been anything achieved by me, by thought or word or deed, if from my lips has ever fallen one word that has helped anyone in the world, I lay no claim to it. It was all his. All that has been life-giving, strengthening, pure and holy has been his inspiration, his words, and he himself. Out of his plans and discussions came the Ramakrishna Mission Association, a mighty body of men and ideas. It all led to the Belur Mat or monastery. It held, among other things, the following ideas or ideals. To train people so that they could teach others and lead to the material and spiritual welfare of the masses. To promote and encourage the arts and industries. To spread among the people Vedantic and other ideas as exemplified in the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. Vivekananda's vision of utilizing religion for the welfare of the common man 
was gradually taking shape. The Swami found no inherent conflict between, say, science and religion, or between religion and the practical arts, or between religion and industry. He sent Swami Ramakrishnananda to organize the center in Madras and others elsewhere. In a short time, a number of missions were established all over the country, all doing good, substantial work. Nor did he forget the West. He sent Swami Saradananda and Swami Abhedananda to carry on the Vedanta teaching in the West. Thus, several active centers came into existence in New York, San Francisco, Hollywood, Tobacco Canyon, Los Angeles, London, Paris, and elsewhere. But Swami Vivekananda not only sent people abroad, he welcomed a few home and trained them for work. The most outstanding of these was Miss Margaret Noble from England, the first Western woman to be received into an Indian monastic order. The Swami gave her a new name, Nivedita, or the Dedicated One. Never was a name more justified. She soon started a school for girls. At first, not many came, though the teaching was free. Later, it became an institution. This is how the school looks today, one of the best and a fitting memorial to Sister Nivedita's work for Indian children. But the Swami's health was causing anxiety. The strain had begun to tell. His Western disciples suggested a trip to America. He went, but there was no rest in his vocabulary. His health did not improve, and he returned to India unannounced. In spite of his shattered health and living under serious restrictions, he had little or no rest. Visitors from all over India and abroad came to see him constantly. One of these was Mahatma or Mr. Gandhi from South Africa. Unfortunately, the Swami was then not at Belur, and the two could not meet. What a loss, my countrymen. Once Pandit Sakharam Ganesh Deuskar, well-known editor of Hittavadi, came to see him with a few friends. Coming to know that one of them was from the Punjab, the Swami started to speak about the food situation there, which was then acute. It was a short interview. At the time of leaving, one of the gentlemen expressed regret. Sir, we have come with great expectations to hear some religious talks from you. Unfortunately, our conversation was taken up with commonplace matters. At this, the Swami turned grave and said, Is the concern over my people a commonplace matter? Sir, so long as even a dog in my country remains without food, to feed and take care of him is my highest duty. Anything else I consider as non-religion or false religion. Swami Vivekananda thought not only about the men of India, but he had given deep and anxious thought to the problems of Indian women. A bird cannot fly with only one wing, he used to say. He looked upon Sharada Devi, the consort of Sri Ramakrishna, as the ideal of Indian womanhood. He dreamt of a convent to be run on the lines of the monastery at Belur. He did not live to see the dream come true, but now the convent, Sharada Mat, is a reality. But Swami Vivekananda's thoughts were confined not to India alone. It included the whole world and the civilization. I belong to India just as much as I belong to the world. I love India. But every day my sight grows clearer. What is India or England or America to us? We are servants of God. The East and the West may make their full contribution to the perfection of humanity. And the last civilization of the world may be a civilization not of struggle and warfare, but of peace and charity and harmonious cooperation to a great end. He knew that the end was near. On July 4th, 1902, the 11th day of the moon, he fasted following the orthodox rule. That day, he insisted on serving the meal to his disciples. 
After the meal was over, the Swami stood by to pour water on the hands of the disciples. At this, Nevadita protested. It is we who should do these things for you, Swamiji, and not you for us. But Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. It was the last time. The words rose to Nivadita's lips, but remained unuttered. Was this the last time, too? At seven o'clock in the evening, the bell rang for worship in the chapel. But the Swami went into his room, where he spent some time in solitary meditation. Then he went into deep samadhi and cast off the body like a worn-out gun. Swami Vivekananda had passed away, or, as we say, he had given up the body. Gloom and desolation fell upon the monastery. But beneath it all, the voice of the leader went on, an undying inspiration for ages. Friends, I do not seek my personal salvation. May I be born again and again to suffer a thousand miseries so that I may worship the only God I believe in, the sum total of all souls. And above all, my God, the wicked, my God, the miserable, my God, the poor of all races and all species, is the special object of my worship. The entire country was plunged in sorrow and despair. But would India ever forget Swami Vivekananda and his winged words? The future would tell. Three years after Swami Vivekananda had passed away, the revolt of Bengal in 1905 was a prelude to the All India Movement. the life and works of Swami Vivekananda has continued to inspire the people. It may be that I shall find it good to get outside my body, but I shall not cease to work, to inspire men and women until the world shall know that it is one with God. Much has been done, though much more remains unfulfilled. We perceive his influence still working gigantically. We know not well how, we know not well where, and we say, Behold, Vivekananda still lives in the soul of his mother, in the souls of her children. Across the ages sounds his call, the call of India and of the world's unborn soul. This is the theme of India's life work, the burden of her eternal song the backbone of her existence, the very reason of her being, the spiritualization of the human race. Kavayo Vadanti